Hi guys, um, I thought today we'd do another uh, beginners uh, tutorial video. Um, we've looked at the past in the past at electricity and current, AC, DC, resistors, capacitors. And today I want to look at the third type of passive component, which is inductors. Um, so basically, these go together with two types of components we've already looked at: the resistors, capacitors. Yeah. inductors. So these are the three types of passive components. They're called passive components. And they're called passive components by the way because the way they react to AC and DC is effectively linear. It follows set rules. Yeah. So for a given voltage or a given frequency they will pass a certain amount of current. That's why they're called passive those three okay um, so inductors what are they well basically an inductor is just uh, a metal core with wire wrapped around it it's a winding on a core yeah and the core is usually a magnetic material um, it could be iron uh, quite often it's ferrite okay ferrite is basically a mixture of ceramic pottery basically so ceramic with iron oxide and other iron compounds ores mixed into the ceramic um, could be various metal compounds but they're all magnetic compounds yeah and that's what ferrite is so you take a piece of wire and you wrap it around a material that can magnetize and you might think, well, what's special about that? Well, what's special about it is that this coil wrapped around this material can store electrical power, yeah? It stores electricity, basically. And it does that by storing it in the magnetic field. So as you pass current through here, this starts off demagnetized, and the longer you pass the current through, the more magnetized it becomes until it becomes fully magnetized. At which point it's called saturated, yeah? Or saturation. So saturation is the point at which this metal or ferrite uh, core can no longer magnetize any further. And you might think, in fact, you could well think, because we talked about capacitors, and you say, yeah, but Rich, don't uh, capacitors store electric electricity, basically? And yeah, they do, uh, but they do it in two completely different ways. And they have different properties, and this is what we need to talk about today, really the difference between inductors and capacitors, if you like. So let's go back to the original, do you remember if you, did, if you watched the first videos on the electricity and current and resistance and voltage? And we were looking at water tanks. So basically, we had this. We effectively had a water tank. Full of water, yeah? And a pipe coming out of the tank. And we can put a narrow section of pipe in here, yeah? A wider section in here. There's a bucket. And basically, while there's water in the tank, the water runs down the pipe into the bucket. And the amount of the water that flows down is dependent on a few things. One is the pressure of the water. So the more you push down on here, the higher the pressure. Electrically, that pressure is the same as the voltage. So more voltage means more water will flow, or in that case, current will flow. And the width of the pipe also determines, so that the wider the pipe, the more water flows, yeah? The narrower the pipe, the less. So this width of this pipe basically is resistance. And the more narrow the pipe, the more resistance it is, the higher the resistance, yeah? And that's basically how current flows. Um, we didn't do the same for capacitors, but we're going to do it now. So let's look at your capacitor. This is the water tank. Here's a pipe coming out of the bottom of it. And this is a closed water tank. It has a pipe coming in. And it's sealed so it can't overflow, yeah? And this pipe coming in has a tap in the pipe, yeah? And it's connected to a water source, okay? A pump or a reservoir, or whatever. It's connected to a water source, yeah? Coming in. 
there's a pipe coming out and the pipe coming out goes down to a bucket okay now when there's water in the tank water will flow out into the bucket so current will flow through here yeah water currents will flow electric currents will flow as long as there's water in the tank if the tank is empty then the water stops flowing so if this pipe is bigger than this pipe this tank will gradually fill up yeah because more is flowing in they can flow out until it reaches full it reaches capacity yeah it reaches full capacity if you like that's your capacitance so this is a capacitor okay and if you think about this if we turn this water on and off yeah when we turn the water on water will come in and start to fill the tank and water will be flowing out when we turn the tap off the level of the water will decrease water will flow back out of the tank into the bucket when we turn the tap back on again if we turn it back on before the tank is empty it fills up again and if we turn it off again it starts to empty again and that's what a capacitor is doing it's storing electricity and then effectively when the supply stops it continues to supply the load with electricity so this tank effectively is a capacitor yeah now let's have a look at an inductor inductor is a little bit more complicated but not, not really so um, so to consider the inductor we're going to start off with a pump this is a water pump yeah and this is a closed circuit so that means the water flows out goes through whatever and comes back in again yeah it's a closed circuit so here we'll have a branch in the pipe okay so the water can go two ways here and on this branch we'll have a narrow section yeah come back down and this will go back to here have a drawn it right yes I have so that narrow point point if you like that's your resistance or yeah <coughs> and it's quite we'll make it narrow now then further down this pipe we have a water wheel okay so in here is a water wheel and we'll draw the water wheel in here yeah there's your water wheel and you should only put six on it <laughs> so seven veins again so coming out of the water wheel comes back to here so the water now has two ways of going when the pump starts it's pumping water the water's got two ways it can come back round to complete the circuit complete the loop yeah but at first this water wheel will be static it won't be moving and imagine this water wheel is big and it's heavy so it takes some time it has some inertia the pressure will st of the water from the pump will start to move the wheel but at first it, it's static so it takes time to get moving yeah so what happens at first when we turn the pump on some water will flow down here yeah and back around that way water will come to here and put pressure on the wheel but it can't go anywhere till the wheel turns but the wheel starts to rotate around so when it's starting to move a bit a bit of water is now coming down the pipe here yeah and going round and the pressure causes this water wheel to f accelerate faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and eventually the water wheel will, will reach its full rotation speed yeah at this point most of the water is now going round the wheel so coming down here now is a lot of current yeah this effectively reduces the pressure the pressure difference between this side of the water wheel and this side effectively is reduced because of a lot of water flowing this way this means because the pressure here is reduced now only a very small amount of water comes down that pipe that water wheel basically is an inductor it has the same properties of an inductor basically to electricity so that's the analogies let's have a look and compare this now to electrical circuits so we can really understand what's happening so 
we know with the resistor, a resistor will just pass a certain amount of current depending on the voltage across it. That's it. So, for example, let's look at a resistor. Let's have a little simple. So we've got 12 volts. We've got a resistor and 0 volts, yeah? And I always forget to draw it. Here is a switch. So when we close the switch, the voltage here goes from 0 to 12. Yeah? So if you measure from here to here, initially there's 0. When you close the switch, it goes to 12. And for all intents and purposes, it does that instantly. Okay? From one instance to the next, there's 0 and then there's 12. When you open the switch, it goes straight back down to 0 again. And it'll stay at 0 until you close the switch. It goes back up to 12 again. So what's happening on here, if you're repeatedly opening and closing the switch, as you go 0, 12, 0, 12, 0, 12, yeah? Measured with a meter from here to here. So that's, 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 that's your meter measuring, yeah? And that's what you'll see. Okay. Let's have a look at a similar circuit with a capacitor. I'm going to keep the resistor because it demonstrates better what I'm trying to show. The same thing would happen without a resistor is what I'm going to show you now, but that was so fast you couldn't really see it happening, yeah? So we're going to use a resistor to limit the current a little bit. So there's a resistor, and here there's a capacitor. It's an electrolytic one we put the symbol. It's quite a big capacitor, okay? And here is 0 volts. What happens now? When we press the switch, we close the switch, yeah? The voltage at this end of the resistor immediately goes from 0 to 12. Yeah? 0, 12 volts, instantly. But the other end of the resistor can't do that. And the reason it can't do that is this capacitor is discharged. So effectively, to start off with, this is basically a short circuit. The electrons will come piling into here and charge the capacitor. So, when this end suddenly goes from 0 to 12, on this end, yeah? What happens at this end is the capacitor has to charge up. And it'll charge up rapidly at first, then gradually slow and slow until it reaches its full charge. So if we draw a line like that, line like that, this is your waveform, 0 to 12, yeah? This will go like that. It'll charge rapidly, then slow until it reaches charged, okay? When you switch the switch off, this end of the resistor will now go back to zero, yeah? But our capacitor has got a charge, and that charge has to go somewhere. To give it somewhere to go, I'm going to put a load here. It would go anyway, because the capacitance itself will have some rigid internal resistance. But to make it clear, let's put a resistor here. So what's happened is now, we've switched off the switch. This end suddenly goes to 0 volts, but this end, the capacitor's here, and the capacitor will discharge. It can't discharge this way because the switch is open. So it discharges this way. Yeah? That way. So the voltage here will decrease rapidly at first, then gradually slowing as it reaches the point where it's discharged. If we turn it back on again, the switch back on, the same thing will happen over again. So each time this switch switches on, this capacitor charges, discharges, charges, discharges, yeah? And that's what you would see if you looked at the voltage here changing with an oscilloscope. That's what you would see happening. Or even if you put an LED here, you'd, you'd see it's effectively start to dip, start from dim and go to bright. And then when you open the switch, it'd still stay bright and go back to dim. You'd see this happening if the resistor was big enough and if the capacitor was big enough to, so it happened in a time you can see not like in a thousandth of a second it may take a few seconds yeah so that's what you would see happening to the voltage on this end of the capacitor yeah as you can see the capacitor is is storing voltage basically on the charge side the power voltage current comes in some of it charges the capacitor and some goes through the load yeah so basically, the supply is charging the capacitor and supplying the load. Once the capacitor is charged, it's all going into the load. Once you switch this off, the capacitor goes into the load. So the current still flows the same way. As long This is like your water tank. As long as you never let it fill up and you never let it empty, there will always be the same current flowing through this load, basically. In fact, if you let it fill up, it's okay. So if you let it empty, it will stop. Okay. 
let's have a look at the inductor so this is your inductor 12 volts I, I, I told you I always forget the damn switch switch yeah uh, we're going to come through the resistor and we're going to go through an inductor yeah no volts and we're going to put a load on and I could draw the I could draw the load here well I'm actually going to draw it here and you'll see why I've drawn it here in a minute load yeah it doesn't matter if I drew it there or there I'm, I'm sure you can see it's the same thing wherever I draw it it's still there yeah okay what happens now we close the switch this end of the resistor instantly goes from 0 to 12 okay this end of the resistor assu assuming by the way that the value of this resistor is small compared to the value of the load because it's a voltage divider but anyway if the value of this resistor is small to, compared to the value of this like a hundredth or something what you'll see happen is you'll see the voltage here go to 12 volts and the reason being it goes to 12 volts is because this coil is not magnetized this water wheel is standing still yeah but as soon as the pressure builds up the 12 volts gets here this starts to turn faster and faster really it starts to magnetize more and more yeah so what you'll see happens to the voltage here initially it'll go straight up to 12 and then it'll drop because this is drawing more and more current so the voltage at this point is dropping yeah once this is fully magnetized this basically becomes a short for all intents and purposes that becomes a short circuit just a bit of wire and the voltage across a short circuit you know is zero so you'll see the voltage come up and go to zero now what happens when you put the voltage back to zero this is interesting right? what happens when you suddenly drop the voltage on the resistor back to zero right well, let me just go back to the water wheel and show you what happens in the water wheel and then you will see what happens when the water wheel is standing still yeah you s started the pump and the water was flowing down through this resistor yeah this narrow piece of pipe some started going through the inductor until lots and lots was going through the inductor the water wheel yeah the water wheel the water wheel started to spin until it reached its maximum rate of spin and there's a lot of water coming this way what happens if we switch the tap off well if we switch the tap off this water wheel can't just stop it can't just instantly stop the same as it couldn't instantly start spinning at its full speed it can't instantly stop so the water wheel continues to spin it's slowing down but it's got inertia yeah it's slowing down but it's still spinning and while it's slowing down the water is still flowing through it and the water now is flowing down here it can't go this way because the tap switched off so it's flowing down here and back up into the water wheel like that, yeah that's where the water is flowing like that, through the water wheel and it'll gradually slow down until it stops and it stops flowing but look something very important happened here and very interesting when the tap was on the water was flowing through the load in that direction positive to negative pressure to no pressure when you switch the tap off the water wheel continues to spin and the water now is flowing through the load that way positive to negative negative sorry because there's more pressure here than there is here look what's happened to this load first the current flows one way and then the current flows the other way and when you turn the tap back on the current will start flowing this way again and it'll start speeding the water wheel back up again can you see that the flowing one way the other way one way the other way the polarity here the plus and minus is changing when the pumps on this end is plus when the water wheel is just coasting slowing down this end is minus and that's what happens to our circuit here so input pulse yeah on off 
Turn it on. End of the resistor, 12 volts, yeah? Our coil, this end of the resistor, goes to 12. And then the, the coil magnetizes up and it drops to zero, yeah? When we switch this off, this end goes to zero volts. Our end now reverses the polarity and goes to minus. Minus 12, basically, or more. And that's what's happening. So what we're doing is, we're producing both a positive and a negative voltage here. I hope you can see that. You can see, if you understand what's happening, I'm sure anybody, you can understand what's happening with this water wheel and why the flow is reversing yet. Yeah. So, I hope that makes it extremely clear why the voltage here is going plus minus, plus minus, even though we've only got a positive supply coming in through the switch. That is a very important property of inductors. Uh, that is the way that a lot of circuits work, book regulator circuits, transformer circuits, switch mode power supplies, all rely on this principle. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit more now about inductors. See you in a moment. Let's have a thing. So, inductance. How do we measure it? Uh, how, you know, what is it measured in? What are the units of inductance? Um, and what determines it? Well, basically, as we know, an inductor is a coil around a magnetic uh, form, uh, a core, yeah? Okay. So, the inductance is measured in Henry's okay which is H uh, one Henry is quite a lot of inductance uh, it's a bit like capacitors one fab is a hell of a lot of capacitance so in a lot of cases you'll see things uh, sort of quoted in milli Henry's and micro Henry's so a milli Henry is a thousandth yeah a milli Henry is one Henry divided by a thousand or naught point naught naught one Henry yeah one micro Henry is a millionth. Naught point naught 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 one. Yeah. So that's what. Uh, sometimes I get these notes wrong, you know. That's a thousand, three more. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's how we actually measure Henry's, milli Henry's, and micro That's what you're most likely going to find in circuits. Yeah. You might find some big coils in Henry's, but. Usually, they're quite small values, like so. Um, they called Henry after a guy named Joseph Henry in the mid to late 1700s. Did a lot of work on electromagnetism and inductance, and effectively formulated uh, a lot of science, a lot of physics. There's a lot of maths involved with this, which we're not going to talk about because a because maths ain't very interesting, and b because we don't actually need it. You know, to fix up, we don't need the maths. We're not circuit designers. If you are, then this place will teach you that. Um, the other thing with uh, inductors, on a, a circuit diagram, uh, resistors are R, yeah, capacitors are C, inductors are L. Now you might think, well, why are they L? The basic reason is you'd think an inductor would be I, wouldn't you? But we've already used I for current, so current is I. I equals current, yeah, which comes from the French intensity to current elect electrical. Intensity to current electrical, I can't even, I'm not French. But it's I, yeah, so we can't use I. So, <laughs> as far as anybody knows, you can go and Google this, they just used L, you know, you're calling it something now, let's call it L, that will do, yeah. Um, the amount of inductance in a coil depends on a number of factors, but the main ones are the length of the winding, the number of turns in the winding, the type of magnetic core used the type of material uh, and also the the um, cross section of the wire, wiring how thick the wire is those are the main things that affect inductance but then we're not designers we're more interested in you know fixing things when they go wrong yeah but that's effectively what what it sets the amount so the, the longer the winding the more turns in the wind in particular the more milli henry's or henry's that we've got yeah okay so Another thing with inductors, we get some special inductors. Um, 
and there's a number of types uh, so let's just have a quick mention about those so one of the specialized types of inductors are relays yeah what a relay is basically is this coil okay and attached to here on a pivot is a piece of metal steel shall we say yeah uh -uh. and when you pass a current through this as we said it magnetizes the core and the magnet attracts iron or steel so it basically attracts this is on a pivot so this moves down and touches the the core yeah the other end of this can be used effectively to form an electrical contact between here and here so when this comes down that moves out and it makes the contact that's basically a relay yeah uh, another type of specialized um, inductor is a solenoid solenoid uses much of the same principle but with a solenoid we have the coil effectively wrapped around a magnet a physical magnet with a north and south pole yeah and you know when you put the magnetism through here this is effectively becomes the electromagnet so when you magnetize sorry when you pass the electrical current through this coil this magnet will move one way or the other and the direction will move depending on which end of this is plus or minus if you reverse it will move the opposite way and this can be moved can work in actuator uh, good example of this uh, model train set yeah so you've got your train track coming in and here you've got a set of points you know like a set of points where the, the train can go either way yeah and effectively you have a bar in here which, which effectively moves the rail so it, it switches between the two positions yeah there's your train track not very good drawing but that's a solenoid on the model train set and it, and it actuates moving to switch the direction of the train and to be quite honest on on the railway lines you know genuine full-size passenger railway lines the points will work like that um, door actuators you know automatic doors where you effectively you have to you know show your face or type in a number and the the lock effectively will be a solenoid or a type of solenoid so uh, safety even i mean there's lots of places where you would use solenoids um motors effectively are inductors uh, with a motor you'll have a number of windings around the circular magnet effectively so so effectively you'll have a coil like so the normal draw like this coil like so rotating thing north south yeah and by switching the current between these two each one does have a, a core in causes this to spin round that's effectively a motor which is a type of inductor and you need this because relays solenoids and motors all have inductance and although we're not using them as an inductor it's important to know they have inductance because it affects the type of circuit that you use to, to switch them to work them yeah right. the other main type of inductor no, sorry, let's keep on here. the other main type of inductor specialized type of inductor is a transformer okay what a transformer is in its most basic form coil yeah magnetic core another coil wrapped around the same core okay when you pass current especially alternating current through this coil you, you continually reverse the direction of, of the current yeah so what happens is this core will continually magnetize in one direction and the other so it'll magnetize with north and south this way that will go with south and north this way north and south this way south and north this way and so on it'll continually to reverse the magnetic field in this coil yeah because this is wrapped around the same coil and as much as passing the current through a wire creates builds and destroys charge and discharge the magnetic field in the core charge and discharge the magnetic magnetic field in the core induces an electric current into the winding so it's basically the same thing just opposite around this current is charging and discharging the core and the discharging and discharging of the core is inducing the current into the wire uh, a lot of maths with uh, these uh, but the one you need to know important one the voltage you get on this this is called the primary this is the one that you're driving yeah and this is called the secondary this is the coil that you're inducing the current into and basically 
the only important thing you need to know is this. The relationship between the two voltages depends on the relationship between the, the amount of windings, yeah? So effectively, if this one has 50 times more, 50 times more turns than this one has, then this will have a 50th of the voltage as that. Let's say with 10 times. So say you've got on here 100 volts, yeah? AC. I say it's 120 volts, why not? Because you use that in a lot of countries, don't you, for your mains, yeah? 120 volts coming in, yeah? If this has 10 times as many turns on the winding as that has, this will have 12 volts coming out, a tenth. Yeah? That, that's how it is. So you have a ra the ratio of the winds would be 10 to 1, yeah? If it was 5 to 1, this would be twice as much, 24 volts. That's how a transformer works. The second thing you need to know is this. Physics says energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It only can be converted, yeah? So if you had 120 volts coming in and you've now got 12 volts coming out, where's the rest of the energy gone to? Yeah? Well, what's happened is this. Coming in, you've got 120 volts, yeah? And say the resistance or the impedance of this winding is designed in such a way that this draws one amp, yeah? coming in. On this side you've got 12 volts going out but you've now got 10 amps. So you've got a tenth of the voltage but 10 times the current. So effectively 120 times 1 amp equals volts times amp equals 120 watts or sometimes called 120 VA volt amps. Yeah? Here 12 times 10 V times A equals 120 watts 120 VA okay so that's how it, it conforms to the laws of physics um, so normally speaking you have a high voltage low current primary and a low voltage high current secondary but it could be the other way around you can have transformers that step the voltage up to very high voltages you used to see a lot of that on old CRT TVs um, what sets the performance of the transformer the only one you need to know about from a repair point of view is this the higher the frequency of the AC the more efficient it becomes so on a mains transform 120 volt like one amp this would be quite a big chunky transformer yeah but say 120 volts American that'd be 60 hertz yeah say you could increase the frequency of this electrically by switching on and off very rapidly to 60,000 hertz, yeah? 60 kilohertz. This suddenly becomes much more efficient. I wouldn't say a thousand times more efficient, but you can now use a much smaller transformer to get the same performance. That's the only thing you really need to know about that. Um, let's look at some electrical symbols now on circuit diagrams. What do you see? What do you see? Well, an inductor, I draw them like this. But I, think, but I think that's kind of the old way. A lot of people kind of draw them like this now. But those are the two symbols you will see for inductors. And on like the circuit diagram, you'll see L, like L1, L3. That's like coil number one, coil number three. It's just the identification of that component, not the value of it, yeah? Um, you'll often also see inductors drawn like this. That's a solid core, iron, steel, whatever, some sort of metal. And you'll see inductors drawn like this. That's ferrite, the ceramic, uh, form of ceramic with like effectively iron oxide dust in it, yeah, and other metals. So you'll see them drawn like that. Relays. Um, usually like this uh, and you will have on this side of it effectively a switch yeah so that's that's quite often the symbol for a relay um, you will also sometimes see them as I showed before actually 
Sorry, cool. It's a bit like that, yeah? That's a relay. Um, just what I'm just mentioning about relays, you'll see, you'll sometimes see a symbol like this as well. Okay. That's your coil. And then you will see, I'll draw a different type of relay just to discuss something else quickly as well. This effectively is a two-way relay. So the switch is showing over here. So normally when it's not magnetized, you will see the switch, those two points are connected together. When this magnetizes, the switch moves to this one, and these two are connected together. The ones that are normally connected together when it's not magnetized are called normally closed. Yeah, makes sense, normally closed. Or NC, yeah? The ones where it's normally open until you magnetize it obviously this is normally open yeah norm open i won't even bother write the whole thing out yeah this is normally open when it's like that. and this one in the middle this is often called common so you'll see that quite often um don't confuse normally closed with nc which means no contact that's something else you see in circuit diagrams as well um yeah so that's those solenoids um, usually would be something like this with an arrow yeah that's a, a solenoid or quite often actually the other way as well with a coil like this yeah it's probably more often shown with a coil actually and then through the coil is an arrow that's a solenoid the, the arrow normally points in the direction in which it will move for a plus and minus but not necessarily uh, so that's that yeah transformer i did draw a transformer before right so yeah and there are special types of transformers as well this is your primary normally left hand side is normally primary this is secondary yeah uh, you'll get transformers like this where you have the primary and you may have two or more secondaries yeah so you can get transformers like this with multiple secondaries and you can also get transformers like this um, with The center tap so effectively if we measure from here if we call this naught volts this end would or the other end but let's say this end would be positive and this end would be negative so you'd often see one like this uh, with what make it positive actually is a diode ignore that if you like you often see ones like this two diodes and here capacitor and here another capacitor that's connected this diode conducts when this ends positive and this one when this ends negative and here we can have for example like 0 volts plus 9 volts for example minus 9 volts so you see transformers like that um, so that's there, you'll find some variations a um, couple more that come to mind is uh, variable inductor yeah you're more likely to see that in radio frequency circuits and one more no two more that this is what's called an auto transformer okay as you see, it only has one winding, it only has a primary, and we've taken the tap off the primary. But if, for instance, like this tap was halfway up the winding, 50%, if we put 240 volts in here, we get 120 volts out of here. Yeah? That's a cheap way of doing that. 
The disadvantage is there's no isolation. You can see in all these, effectively, this circuit is isolated from this circuit by the magnetic field. There's no electrical connection between the primary and secondary. There's no connection, primary and secondary. This there is. This will effectively give you safety from the mains. This won't. Last one. Definitely the last one. Variac. With this one, you again say you had 240 volts here, yeah? 240 volts, 0 volts, AC. This, in fact, is a slider that can move up and down the coil like a variable resistor. And here, if you slide it all the way down here, you would have 0 volts. And if you slide it all the way up there, you'd have 240 volts. And you'd be able to get every voltage in between. That's a Variac. Useful bit of test kit. Um, not so much these days, more for if you're working on vintage electronics, but back in the day that was a very useful bit of kit, and I have one. Um, can be useful, uh, for especially with audio equipment and that sort of thing. So that's the symbols. Now then, let's get to the really interesting stuff. Let's find another piece of paper. Have we used them all? So we have. Ah, use the back of this one. What goes wrong? This is what we really want to know, isn't it? What goes wrong? Normally speaking, inductors are very, very reliable components. It's very unusual to find a faulty inductor. Um, transformers, a bit more likely but inductors no it's extremely unlikely the only th really thing that can go wrong with an inductor is it can go open circuit yeah that's the most common thing uh, two reasons one it can actually burn out uh, but it's not so common that they'll, they'll burn out um, especially if the winding is very thick it's more likely inductors can be quite heavy. Um, let me show you a few inductors and we'll just come back to this. Let me just show you a few first. So, this is a, off a light dimmer effectively. Um, this is an inductor, yeah? Coil. This is a transformer. Can you see this? You've got one wind in here with a small number of, no, with a number of turns on and then a small wind in here, yeah? And you can see down here as well. So, inside, probably, this is the primary coming in down here, yeah? And there's a coil inside there. This big coil on the outside, this will be the output, and this will be the secondary. I can see one end of it connects to here, and it looks like the other end of it comes down the middle of the coil to there, yeah? So, this is your secondary, which you can see, very heavy tracks. And this is your primary over here which are narrower tracks. So this is the high voltage low current side and this is the low voltage high current side. This came off a light fitting which I think was 12 volts with lots of amps. Uh, I think it was like a something like a 200 foot, say it was a 240 watt fitting. So that that's like you know 12 volts at 20 amps something like that. And this circuit effectively can control this. So that's a transformer. Um, Here's another little uh, circuit. Let's just zoom in on this one and have a look at this one. Okay, so here's um, some inductors on this one. Oops, sorry, the focus is gone. One moment. Uh, this is off a, a, a TV, I think, this one. Uh, T-Con board. Um, so here, you'll commonly see these. These are inductors. These are in book regulator circuits. We'll, we'll do a whole... A video about book regulators because it's an extremely important circuit. But if you've been watching the videos we've done, you'll, you'll sort of know about them. These are small inductors. Um, another one, quite a few of them. Um, these will be on the input most likely. I won't even trace to see where they go, but uh, these are inductors, yeah. This one's got much thicker winding than this one. This is a transformer, yeah. So with the transformer, you can see there's windings on, on this end. Can you see them there? 
and there's windings on this end as well. You can see the contacts there, yeah? So that's a transformer. This will be a transformer using switch mode power supply, which will have uh, a very high frequency operation, requiring a much smaller transformer than if it was in, um, you know, like a mains frequency uh, power supply. There's a transformer. Um, another inductor here, more transformers. Um, any of the little ones on here? Yeah, yeah. one of the small inductors here. So this is what inductors look like on, on the board, yeah? Now, back to what goes wrong with them. Open circuit. Let's just zoom that out. Okay, so they can go open circuit. Now, you've just seen some inductors on these boards, yeah? Uh, one reason to go open circuit would be a burnt out winding. You know, where the wiring, in fact, is too much going to get burnt out. But that's not common at all. Um, more likely, you can see these things are heavy. They're quite big, hefty components, yeah? Now, that puts mechanical strain on the board. So if you've got things which are portable in particular and get you moved around a lot, especially automotive and those sort of applications, then effectively this thing can fracture the connections where it's soldered to the board. Uh, and that is quite often the cause of inductor open circuit. It's not the inductor, it's where it's soldered to the board, yeah? Um, the other thing that can go wrong with an inductor is shorted turns. Okay, shorted turns. And this could happen in any inductor, but it's much more common to see this in transformers. So you have a transformer uh, with a secondary. And you have like 240 volts coming in, yeah? And we have 12 volts coming out. So there's 20 times more windings there are here than there are here. But this can have several thousand, let's say it's got a thousand turns, yeah? And, and this has got obviously 20 times as many as that. Probably these figures are way out, but anyway, it, it makes the point. So, if you imagine you get a short circuit between two turns because they're very close together, now you might think to yourself, well, yeah, but we've now got 999 turns, so the ratio is so close that you wouldn't even notice any difference on the 12 volts. But that isn't what happens. That shorted turn now basically becomes a secondary with one turn in it, yeah? Which is now connected to a short circuit. Yeah? Very few turns, so very little voltage, but you know how we said this? F for effectively 240 volts in, 12 out, yeah? If this is one amp, this can provide 20 amps, okay? This one turn is, let's say it's like 0.1 one volt yeah but the current this can draw is massive so this is a short circuit on the transformer and all of a sudden all the inducted current goes into here yeah two things happen this is taking all the current so there isn't much current inducted into here this drops yeah the current going through this primary goes up massively yeah because you're drawing so much power this goes up what will happen normally is this winding burns out and the reason being this is 20,000 turns this winding is very thin wire yeah this is good thick wire so this probably won't blow it might burn but it probably won't much more likely this will burn out that's the other common fault and the same can apply with just an inductor yeah, if you get a short circuit between a turn, one turn, then now what you've got this is this. Yeah, you effectively, really, it's not. It's like an auto transformer, but effectively you've got that. I know it's not isolated, but effectively what you've got that. So that one shorty turn can destroy the performance. Effectively, it can't magnetize the coil anymore because while it's trying to magnetize this coil this short circuit is drawing all the magnetism back out of it again so effectively the whole thing becomes like a short circuit 
and you can guarantee if you've got something like that and you've got uh, a MOSFET up here driving it, if you get something like that it's going to go bang if you get something like that on the sort of coils you find on uh, motherboards, older ones this type uh, I need to find one where there isn't many turns but you can get these like this one where there isn't that many turns, you can sometimes it, it'd be sure to be damaged yeah, and you effectively get some of this enamel scraped off and you can actually, this is a good one, this is a better one this is the one I want to show you let me just zoom in on this yeah that's better so this this is an inductor you see it's very thick wire so if you had a short e you see it's because the two of these be pushed together and they'd be scraped off the enamel you can see where the short is and you can actually literally move the two apart again and fix that uh but it's not likely to happen unless there's physical damage you'd have to see some physical damage to get a shorted turn on this type of inductor um so that's really the only things that go wrong with with, with uh, inductors open circuits okay just set the zoom again so the good thing about inductors is they very rarely go wrong it's not common um if you've got too much load measure the short turn if you've got too much load on the secondary say like this is supplying something that's on short circuit most likely if anything happens you'll burn out the primary you'll probably blow the fuse because this will probably have a a fuse in here before then and hopefully the fuse will go but you could burn out it's normally the primary that you burn out um, so so the good news is they don't very often go wrong if they do go wrong it's usually because something's short on the output anyway um, the bad news of inductors is if they do go wrong it's often very difficult to find a replacement uh, transformers especially switch mode transformers You'd be very lucky to find a replacement if you've got uh, something faulty with a switch mode transformer um, with shorted turns or an open circuit primary. You'll struggle to find a replacement. Um, if you get on the internet, maybe on some of the specialist repair forums, I mean, you could rewind the transformer or the inductor yourself, but that's very specialist. It would only really be uh worthwhile and expensive maybe pieces of vintage equipment that are very expensive and very rare and there will be specialist uh places on the internet you can look for rewinds and rewinding the specialist companies can do it for you as well uh but generally speaking if you've got a faulty inductor and it's not a broken connection where it joins the circuit board uh and the chances are you probably can't fix the thing that's gone wrong the, the device uh, okay guys i think that's enough uh, on inductors and i'm going to see you on another video very soon cheers now